anyhow. Uh, all right, what we're going to do first is we're going to take a tour of Canvas. Now, have all of you used Canvas before here in class? So most of you have, and, and I would expect most of the people uh, on the online section have as well. But there's a question of how I use Canvas, because each professor can use Canvas a little bit differently. So what we'll do is we'll spend the first part of class reviewing class rules and how the information is organized in Canvas. And then we'll probably spend the last half of the class actually getting into the material uh, of the class. All right, so let's look to see what Canvas looks like. And when you log on to Canvas, you will come to this page where you'll see recent activity. Now, your page might look a little different than this, given that I'm the instructor and I can do certain things that, that you can't as far as a class goes. All right? So um, it'll show things like announcements, anything discussions in the discussion forums, and what things are coming up in this class. Already we have a mistake, because that is not due August 23rd. That is due August 30th. So let me correct that right now. It's amazing. I spend time looking and double checking the dates, and I still end up getting a few of them wrong. So my mistake. You should check Canvas between classes in addition to using it when you turn in stuff. So check Canvas a few times a week. Ideally, you know, maybe check it you know, th uh, Tuesday or very early Wednesday, or check it, uh, and then check it sometime over the weekend. Uh, I post announcements there. So if, for example, I know I'm not going to be in class a certain day for you know, have a doctor's appointment or whatever, you know, I will post that information there. If there is a correction of something I said in class, on occasion, I make mistakes in class. Or someone asks me a question I don't know off the top of my head, and I'll spend time thinking about it, and I might post a correction. Uh, or maybe people have questions. Like, for example, if I didn't notice that the date was wrong, uh, someone might say, hey, your syllabus says one thing, and the date due on the assignment says something else. What's the deal? So I might post corrections like that. So it'll, it'll, it'll benefit you to go and check the announcements at least uh, once a week, or a couple times a week, rather. Uh, here's where you can find the announcements. I have one announcement already, primarily for the online class, but you can look at it as well. Here is the syllabus. One thing I promise not to do, and if I do it, you're allowed to boo me. So you can, you can just start booing, all right? Uh, is I promise not to read the screen to you, uh, unless there's like a really good reason to, all right? Because that's, that's no fun for anyone, all right? Um, what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of hit the highlights of the syllabus. Uh, all of it's important, but there's some things I want to showcase and I might want to add a little bit of information for. If you look at the top part of the syllabus, you'll see a bunch of different ways to contact me. You can contact me via phone. You can Skype with me, provided you contact me in advance. It's not like I'm sitting at home on Skype just waiting for student calls to come in. All right? Uh, so contact me and, or, and arrange an appointment, just like you would arrange in office hours or whatever. You can email me. You can use the phone, although I generally don't prefer not to get phone calls simply because I answer my email much quicker than I answer my phone calls, all right? Um, because, uh, you know, I only check my email when I'm on campus, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I only check my voicemail when I'm on campus, and I check my email much more regularly. The point is that there's a lot of ways that you can contact me. Uh, I will have office hours this semester. I don't know exactly what they are yet. When I do determine them, I will post them and let you know. But know that if you can't fit in any of those other time slots, if you can't make it during office hours and uh, it's something that's difficult so you don't want to necessarily talk about it over the phone because it's kind of hard to ask some, quest some kinds of questions over the phone or whatever, 
Uh, you can always arrange another time. So I may define certain office hours, but I can also arrange other office hours. In addition, this class is composed of two halves, a lecture and a lab. All right. I invite any student from any of my classes to show up for any lab session. Okay, That's sort of a, a, a way that you will sort of automatically get some extra office hours in there. So for example, our lab is immediately following this class in BU 202 from 10 to 11. Uh, I will post the times for those labs, but any student from any class can show up at those labs. Uh, because for the most part, during lab, I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm just sitting there answering questions that people have. So if no one has questions, I'm just sitting there. And maybe I'll check my email grade or whatever. But uh, I have some extra, extra time usually in there. And I might as well help students. So I invite students that have difficulty uh, to come to any lab. The flip side of that is, just like people can sit in on your lab, you can sit in on other classes' labs. And I'll post the exact times in rooms uh, of those labs uh, later this week. In a nutshell, I have a uh, Monday afternoon class that the lab will be 2 to 3. I have a Tuesday morning class that the lab will be approximately 11.30 to 12.30. And I have a Tuesday Tuesday and Thursday evening class uh, that the lab is um, 6.30 to 7.30 PM. So I'll post those hours. So if you can't make it during regular office hours, or if you don't have time to ask the questions that you want to in lab, uh, there's other times. And if none of those work, the wild card is you can talk to me and we can arrange another time. My point is, is I try to be very available to you to answer questions. So whether it be by email, by arranging a Skype meeting, visiting me during office hours, showing up in your lab, showing up in other labs, I think you have ample opportunity to ask any questions you had. I would also suggest that you ask questions. Um, don't wait until you're hopelessly behind to ask questions. All right. Uh, it's, it's a virtue for people that want to figure out their own problems. You know, that's a good thing when you, you have a problem and you're trying to figure it out, that, that you want to do it independently. And I encourage you to do that. But there's sort of the case of where you're making progress towards a goal. And there's sort of a case where you're just spinning your wheels. And you're really not making any progress. And you're just putting more and more effort on it. If you feel that you're not making progress and it gets to be frustrating, uh, let me know one way or another, and we'll try to figure out um, a, a way to get it solved. So that's sort of the point of this whole first part of the syllabus, that there's a lot of different ways to contact me. If you're having trouble, pick one of them, all right? And, and we'll try our best to work out the problems. Yes? Well, I mean, if, if you actually see me in person is, is probably the best. Uh, email is probably second best. Voicemail is probably worst. Uh, because again, I only check it when I'm on campus. Um, so I, you know, um, or uh, even more specifically, I only check it when I'm in my office. So whereas my email, I check pretty regularly. Um, you know, uh, it's amazing sometimes, like, how it must seem to some students that I'm on 24-7, because you know, I'm online all hours, you know, uh, oftentimes grading and doing stuff. So um, you know, sometimes a student will send a message, and they'll get a message back like instantly. Uh, as a general rule, if you don't get an answer within a day or so, if I haven't otherwise said like something's going on, you know, I'm going out of town or whatever, if you don't get an answer in a day or so, it's, it's OK to remind me. It's OK to say, hey, I sent you an email. Like, Let's say you sent me an email on Friday, and you hadn't heard back today yet. It's OK to send me another email saying, hey, I sent you an email Friday, and I haven't heard back. The one thing I will say, when, uh, uh, when you turn in an assignment, if you have a question about the assignment, send an email. Don't add a note to the assignment. All right, Because I grade the assignments typically like once a week. I, I will go and I'll grade all the assignments for a given class once a week. Whereas my email, I check constantly. So if you're like, let's say you didn't get an assignment done complete, and you said, I don't know how to do A, B, or C. 
it's better to email me than to post a note with the assignment. Uh, the idea for me is that your assignment ought to be something that you had completed. Uh, so if it's not complete, it's better to talk to me via email uh, and get a solution to it. All right. Oh, we're still in the syllabus. This description and outcomes is important. This is what we expect you to know when you're done with the class. So read it, keep, your, you know, keep these in the back of your head as we go through the class, because this is the goal. Text and materials, I had a few students say that the bookstore said that there was not a book for this class. Is that correct? That is correct. See if you can find, see, go over there and, and they have them in alphabetical order by author, which I think is insane. But what do I know? I never ran a bookstore in my life. Look under Castro and High Slot for HTML3 and CSS, HTML5 and CSS3. Can we get that in writing as far as this being the required uh, What I would suggest is print out the syllabus. Oh, and the syllabus. Yeah, okay, yeah. Thank yeah. You. yeah. Print, print out the syllabus and that should be sufficient. I don't know. Uh, I know that it's a industry book, so it's not a college textbook, which means that it's inexpensive. So if you were to go to Amazon, you could probably get a good deal on it. You might be able to find it used. Um, well, yeah, I, I'm definitely cognizant of that. I mean, because uh, some of these are, are just crazy how expensive they are. Let's see what Amazon would what it would go for. Just out of curiosity. You can get on your Kindle for $17.27, paperback $31, or, oh, there's a 7th and 8th edition. 7th edition you can get for $1.74. Um, there probably isn't a drastic difference between them. So, you know, if you wanted to get the, the seventh edition, that's probably okay. Uh, my idea on textbooks is this. Um, I don't like read from the textbook or like, you know, the, the absolute worst professor I ever had said, turn to page 15, let's look at the diagram. Oh, and that was, the class was torture, all right? And I don't, in, I don't want to, put myself or put you through that, right? Because it's not fun for me to read a book uh, uh, to my students, and it's not fun for you to be read to. I don't think so, anyhow. So my idea is, my idea of textbooks, of view, my view of textbooks is, is sometimes it's good to get two views on the same topic. Because maybe what I talk about in lecture is more meaningful to you. Or maybe what is in the book is more meaningful to you. But probably, both of them together, will give you a better picture and a better idea of how something works than if you just read me. Uh, with the book, I don't feel obligated to cover every minute detail. I, I feel you know, better to talk uh, about maybe some other things. Um, and, and therefore, it's good to read the book in conjunction with my lectures. All right? Yes? Uh, I just found a book online for free. Can it be uh... Uh, I can't condone that. If it's, yeah, if it's not copyright protected. The one, th uh, cause, because of copyright law. The one thing I will say is uh, anyone here on campus or if you have a library card, you can go to Safari Books Online, all right? And the easy way to remember that is if you go to the library website. I don't know for sure if this book is included on Safari Books Online, but uh, many of them are. Uh, where is the library? There we go. And you go to databases. Ah, Safari Books Online. This has a lot of technical books. So you can click on it. And 
we can search for this book. And here we go. It's available online. This is free and this is legitimate. All right. So uh, the problem with it is, you know, some people don't like to read on screens and, and whatever. So, um, but again, that would be something that you could do. The one, uh, one other thing I want to mention about Safari Books Online is, is sometimes, um, you know, it's good to look for additional materials even online. If you want to know more about CSS than is covered in this class, there's a lot of, a lot of books about it. It's also good to sort of audition books. All right. Uh, rather than just you know um, guessing by the t uh, by the cover or the reviews whether a book is good or not, it's sometimes good to pull up and read a chapter of it online. Even if you don't like to read books online, it's good to read that. Then you look say, oh yeah, this looks like a good book, or this looks like a book that that has what I need. All right. But yeah, this is uh, available. Uh, if you're on campus, uh, because LC has a subscription to this database you automatically connect to it without a problem. If you're off campus uh, and you try to access this, you'll have to put in your library card number, which is like the number on the back of your library card. Not your student number, but like your library card number. Yes? Do you also access it through your MyCampus account? Or is that I don't know. I don't know if it's available through my campus or not. It would be cool if it was. Part Okay, the question was, can you access this through your My Campus? Uh, no one ever pushes a button, by the way. I always say that, but really that's wasting 30 seconds of my time because no one ever wants to do it. And I don't, I don't like make a big deal about it because, I don't know, you could be in a witness protection program or something, right? And, in which case, you don't want your face on camera, which I, I, can, I can understand. All right. Instructor approach. I think the key word is this sentence. This is your class. <clears throat> it doesn't do me good to quote, cover something if you don't understand it, right? It's not a race for me. It's not like I have to get through a certain number of pages per day or whatever. Uh, I'm only covering it so that you understand. So if you have questions, this is a relatively small class. Uh, there's, I think, in the campus uh, class section, there's a total of like 15 people, give or take. So, you know, you're a substantial portion of the class. You're about 6% of the class, give or take. Uh, in addition, and sort of an old teacher proverb, which I, I, I think is probably true, is that if a, one student has a question, there's a good chance other students have a question. So other students in the class may have the question. Other students online may have a question. So if there's something you're not clear about, ask the question. Here's the worst that will probably happen if you ask a question and I don't think it's the right time to talk about it, uh, is I will say, let's talk about it in lab. Uh, what kind of question is that? If you ask a question really specific about uh, something that you're working on, if you say, I'm having a problem where my page is supposed to be green and it's blue, you know, I might try to give a quick answer, but that's a question that's better off than for me to sit down and look at the code, and we look at the code together and we figure it out. So that's, that's one that is probably better off answered that way. In which case, there's no harm. I'll just say, hey, let's talk about that in lab. All right? And we can talk about it then. All right? Read this. I spent a lot of time writing it, so read it. There are a number of college policies that I'm not going to go over, but I mention them here, and you can read more about them in the, the college catalog. Instructors' policies, and it's funny that I, I spent a, maybe maybe this is why I didn't become a writer, you know, but I spent a lot of time writing this about late assignments, and a lot of students got the idea that I'm very strict about late assignments. Actually, quite the opposite. Compared to most instructors on campus, I'm very lenient about late assignments. Because when all is said and done, I'm interested that you learn the material. If you learn it a day or two late, I'm not too upset by it. Here's where the problem with late assignments come in, is that they start to snowball. That if, you've, if you're late on an assignment, and then that puts you at a late start of the next assignment, and you might be a little late on those, and you might be a little late on those, and so on down the line. So if you're ill, for example, and you haven't had a chance to work on something, or you have to go out of town 
uh, or you have family or work responsibilities that keep you from getting an assignment done on time, that's fine. Let me know about it, and you don't have to go in detail. You don't have to, like, you know, spill your guts and, and go in detail about the illness or personal situation or whatever. Just tell me that, you know, you know, I, I had, you know, I had extra work responsibilities this week, so I wasn't able to get this assignment done. If that happens once in a while and you're basically on track the rest of the time, that doesn't bother me at all. If you start getting late on every assignment, that should be a warning sign that something has to change. Because no matter how nice and lenient I am as far as each individual assignment goes, at the end of the semester, everything needs to be done. And if you're still working on lab five the last week of the semester, well, you're not going to be able to squeeze in the other 10 labs in the last three days, right? It's just not going to work that way. So if you are starting to become late more and more frequently and it's sort of habitual, then that's a signal that, you, that, that we need to talk and figure out a way to get things back on track. Uh, it might require you to come in uh, and, and spend some time in office hours or in another class's lab or something like that. Or maybe you, you need to focus more. Or maybe I need to explain something to you that you're having a hard time with or whatever. But that's a sign that it's time for us to talk if you're continually late on assignments. So the bottom line is one or two assignments late, let me know what's wrong, and there's a good chance I won't even deduct for it. All right? If you are late over and over and over again, I might not deduct on the individual assignment, but going forward, it will become a problem, in which case you probably need to talk to me about that. A little bit about incompletes, a little bit about coursework. There's really three main things that your points come from. Homework, a portfolio that's done in two parts part one and the final version of it, and a project which is done in two parts, the design and the final project. Uh, the portfolio and project we're going to talk about uh, later on, not today, but like uh, in, in a few days. And here's the approximate schedule. Notice that assignments are due the Wednesday of the indicated week. I typically assign an assignment one week, and then it's due the following Wednesday. So your first lab I'm assigning today, you know, the start of week one, is due Wednesday of week two. All right? Uh, I will aim to get a couple assignments out there, because the first assignment you can complete typically pretty quickly. All right? Um, but again, that's kind of how it goes. There's a couple of times, like for example, week eight, there's no lab assignment due, but part one of your portfolio is due. Week 11, the project design is due. Week 15, your final portfolio is due, and your final project is due. OK. Most of the action on, uh, in this class appears in the module section. I will have a module for every week. All right. Again, your screen is going to look a little different for, from this because I have pages that um, I don't show to students. All right. I might, they might be examples that I might download or whatever. But typically for each week there's going to be an assignment. There might be other handouts that you're responsible to read. And there is a to-do, which is going to talk about what you need to do this week, what we're going to cover, what you need to do. All right. Uh, the assignments, again, if they're not complete, I would prefer that you email them to me as opposed to hand, uh, turning them in. So if you have a question or problem with it, it's better off to email me instead of turning it in. All right. Uh, fair use handout talks about use of copyrighted materials on your assignments. All right, so read about that. Ask me if you have any questions. In a nutshell, you can use images from other websites on your pages, but 
you have to give credit where credit's due. All right? And then to do this week is just a nice little summary. You will notice I will also have videos of the lecture and uh, any example files I have will appear here as well. All right. You can, there are discussions that you can have. You can post to introducing myself. Um, people in the class, if you need to email someone or email me. Attendance, you can review your grades here, and so on. So if you have any questions, you can ask me. What I want to do the rest of this class period is talk a little bit about developing web pages. All right? And we'll start, we'll look at the, your first assignment uh, probably at the end of class, and we'll start to develop some of the tools that you need to develop web pages. We're not going to go over enough for you to develop your lab one completely. So sometimes I get students that turn in their lab one immediately after. And we haven't gone enough. We won't have gone over enough uh, today to do that. So just be a little patient. You can get started on it, but Thursday, I'm sorry, not Thursday, Wednesday, uh, we'll, we'll kind of cover the rest of it. All right? Okay. Oh. The fundamental language used for creating web pages is HTML. All right, and HTML is an acronym for Hypertext Markup Language. Does anyone have an idea what, what is meant by hypertext? Any sci-fi fans in here? All right. So, Kirk asks Scotty, pardon me, or Spock, or whoever. I'm trying to, trying to keep my generations right. At least I didn't say Worf. All right. Wants to go into hyperspace, or wants to engage the hyperdrive. That might be a different sci-fi. I don't remember. Okay, whatever. A little crossover action here. What does hyper mean when you say hyperdrive, hyperspace? Someone's hyperactive. What do those words mean? Well, fast, that's true. Excessive, all right. Probably uh, uh, all those are correct, like a hyperdrive would take you faster than normal. Uh, someone that's hyperactive is you could, you could say faster or more active than normal. So hyper sort of means beyond the ordinary, is, is in a nutshell. More than over the ordinary. All right, so is the hyperdrive in Star Wars is going to go faster than the normal drive, right? Someone that's hyperactive is more active, all right, than is typical. All right, hypertext then is the idea that web pages just don't contain plain text. All right? It's not just words and letters and numbers. There's all kinds of stuff on web pages. You know, let's pick a web page. Let's look at the Wall Street Journal. I'm picking a boring website on purpose. All right, notice what we have on the Wall Street Journal's website. We have more than just plain old text. We have headlines. All right, so not everything is just letters, 
there's letters that represent headlines. All right? And the differences mean something. It's not just like someone random, randomly made some words bigger. Right? This is a headline. All right? This is a paragraph. In addition to being a headline, this is a link. Notice that when you put your mouse over it, it turns blue. And if you click on it, you go to another page. And there's images on the page. And in some cases, there's videos. So we don't just have plain, ordinary text on this page. We have more than text. So we have hypertext. All right? How do we accomplish that on a web page? Well, we view a web page through what's called a web browser. A web browser is a program that's used to view web pages. And the language that these web browsers speak, there's a couple of them, but the most fundamental language that these web pages speak, the, the language for the content of web pages, is called HTML. It allows for hypertext through the use of what's called a markup language. And we can actually view the HTML code for any web page just by right mousing and saying view page source. We can see the HTML code. I'm going to scroll past all this. I want to get to sort of the heart of the page. Okay, this is a, this is sort of a bad example. Let's view all C's page. Okay. All right. L I A financial aid A L I. These things that look like this that start with a less sign and then have a greater than sign are called tags. Another word for tags is markup. Why do we call it markup? We call it markup because it's almost like what people do when they use a highlighter on their textbook. You're literally marking up your textbook, right? You're marking up your textbook. So if this was your textbook over here, and I that was a page of your textbook. And let's, I, let's say I said this, pa this paragraph here is very important, and it's going to be on your test. What are you going to do if you have a highlighter? You're going to mark it up some way. Maybe you'll highlight it, or maybe you will put a box around it with stars saying, yeah, it's important. And if, well, this information here, that's not so important. We're not going to be covering that. You might put an so you've added meaning to it. You've not just left the text as it is, you've, you've sort of made it hypertext, right? You've added meaning. So it's beyond just plain old text. It includes your markup that says, this means it's important, this means it's not so important. Well, these things in the code are different kinds of markup. So what we're going to start doing is we're going to start creating a simple web page, all right? that um, has some hypertext in it. And we'll start it today, and we'll end it next time. So what we're going to finish today, we only have five minutes left. What we're going to finish today is not going to be a completed web page. It will be part of a completed web page. But it will introduce the, tab, the, the topic of hypertext and markup. To do this, I'm going to use a program called Notepad++. If you don't have Notepad++ on your computer, you can get it for free. Just Google Notepad++ and you can install it. Yes? 
Normal Notepad is fine as well. There's just some nice little features about Notepad++. All right, if you have a Mac, there are comparable programs to it, and we can review it. Um, we can review to, uh, to talk about those. But I'm going to go into Notepad++, and I'm going to start writing some tags. Tags look like this. Start with a less than sign. They have the name of the tag, and then they have uh, something, some text usually. And then they have an ending tag. Tags normally come in pairs, start tag, end tag. What's the difference between a start tag and end tag? This doesn't have a slash in it. This does have a slash in it. This is what's called an H1 tag. That's meaning. That means something. Just like your little star meant something when you marked it up. It means that something's important. The H1 tag means it's a top level headline. When I say top level, I mean it's a more, uh, a very important headline, all right? There's secondary headlines, all right? And guess what tag we'll use for those? we we'll use an H2 tag. Then there's a third level head, headline, H3. It doesn't mean that it's a first, second, or third headline. It's talking about the level, like if you're making an outline. Is this the top level information? Is this a little less important, a little less important, and so on? Exactly, more or less, yeah. So, just a paragraph of text is done in a P tag. It means it's a plain old paragraph of text. Fall starts, when does it start? September 21st, and goes until. December 21st. I think that's right. If not, we'll pretend that's right. And then you can have as many words as you want. I'm just going to put a bunch of blahs here. Because I don't want to type out a whole paragraph. Then we have our end paragraph. All right. So this is our first two tags, an H1 and a paragraph. All right. I'm going to save this as a web page. How do I save it as a web page? I click the Save button. It will ask me what kind of file is it. And I'm going to say it is an HTML file. If you're using plain old notepad, you won't have an option for HTML. You'll simply put all files there. Then I can give it a name, and I'll call it fall.html, and I'll put it on the desktop. Maybe. There we go. And I'll save it. So this is one view of that web page. This is sort of like an x-ray of the web page. Yes. Um, on the tags, does the uppercase versus lowercase matter? Not really, no. You can make the tags upper or lowercase. As a matter of practice, I typically make them lowercase. But some people prefer to use uppercase. All right, so this is the web page. Now, if I look on my desktop, I will notice fall.html. If I double click it, it will ask me what browser I want to use. I'll pick Google Chrome, because that's the browser I like to use. And it will view it as a web page. Notice, that's bigger. That's normal print. Why is this bigger and that's normal print? Right, because the tag that I used. This stuff is included in an H1 tag, so the browser knows it's a headline, 
And what's more, it knows it's the most important kind of headline. So it makes it the biggest. And then the paragraph, it knows, well, that's just a plain old paragraph. Now, if I had an H2 tag here, I could say uh, false boards. Now, if I save it and go here and hit refresh, notice false sports is a little smaller than that because it's an H2. I've said it's sort of a second level headline. It's, it's of second importance. So the browser makes it a little bit smaller. All right? So these are tags. Now, these are not enough tags to do your assignment, but they're enough to introduce you to the concept of tags. What your assignment is to do is to do some research on the web about three topics. HTML, HTML5, and CSS. You'll create a web page that has an article about each of these topics, summarize what you find, what you found. So look up HTML, and you might go visit a couple sites and get a definition of HTML. You'll summarize what you have written, uh, what you've read, and you'll con you have at least one big, you know, you have at least one well-written paragraph, and use the tags that were covered in Chapter One. We covered some of those tags today. We'll cover the rest of them on Wednesday. So. In lab today, you could start sort of doing what I did, making H1s and paragraphs. If you do that, that's enough. Or if you want, just start doing the research, where you look up these, uh, look up these various topics and start writing uh, you know, uh, a little paragraph that summarizes what these are. So that's what we can do in lab today. And Wednesday, you should be able to finish it up. I've given plenty of slack time, just in case you're having trouble getting started, because this assignment is not due until next Wednesday. All right, we will see you up in lab.